Hello, this is Jason Clement, Technical Sales Manager at Isonus, and welcome to the Certification Training Module. This module is Introduction to Networks, Part 2. Course objectives, understand some key advanced concepts relevant to networks and how it may affect the Isonus system. This includes virtual LANs, static and dynamic IP addressing, the domain name system, or DNS, port forwarding, and virtual private networks. So let's talk a little bit about virtual LANs or VLANs. A VLAN is a logical partition within a switch to create multiple broadcast domains. This allows for easy control of traffic and simplified administration. If we have IP cameras and IP phones and workstations and clients and mobile devices, we don't want all of these communicating on the same actual local area network. We want them segmented into VLANs. A typical network will have many VLANs such as VoIP, voice over IP, IP cameras, guest access, etc. Anything that we want to logically partition off that may be on the same physical switch. VLANs operate at layer 2 but work closely with subnets at layer 3. Typically you'll see every single VLAN will be its own separate subnet. So we talk about switches operating at layer 2 but a lot of the switches now are very intelligent and they can actually do a lot of layer 3 functionality as well. So let's take a look at a VLAN example. We'll look at our little network again here that's connected to a switch. We're going to put these PCs on VLAN 100, these PCs on VLAN 200, and these PCs on VLAN 300. Now why did we do that? It looks pretty on the screen. So the purple PCs are our warehouse terminals. They communicate back to a server which handles everything in the warehouse as far as shipping and receiving and all that stuff. And we don't want that traffic on our regular workstation VLAN. So our green VLAN will be our office workstations. And then because we love our employees so much on their breaks and on their lunch hours, we give them public terminals so they can access the internet and check their Facebook and check their email and do whatever they want on there. And again, we don't want that traffic on our regular network. So our purple VLAN, VLAN 100, may be 192.168.0. Our green VLAN may be 192.168.50. And our blue VLAN may be 192.168.100. In a basic reality, we would need a router to switch between all of those different VLANs. Now, because the switches are intelligent, and a lot of them do operate at layer 3. A lot of them can do that communication between the VLANs if you want. So we talked about IP addresses, but how do we manage these? Every network device needs an IP address. Who's going to manage all this stuff? We basically have two different types of addresses. We have static addresses. So an IT administrator logs on. He assigns every device an address manually. He has this gigantic spreadsheet that says this device is this address, etc. So nowadays we have hundreds of devices. Each person may have a desktop, a laptop, a mobile device, and other demo equipment that connects to the network as well. So they could have 10 or maybe 20 addresses between all the equipment that they have. We can't manage that statically for a corporation that may have a thousand or two thousand people. So we need dynamic addressing. So the IT administrator assigns a pool of addresses to a server, which then assigns them to devices using DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Most IT administrators will use both static addresses for the servers for things that we're going to access constantly, our web server and things like that. We don't want that address changing. And then dynamic addresses for the workstations, mobile devices, VoIP phones, all that other stuff that we really don't need to track the IP address for. So how does DHCP work? All of our warehouse terminals, maybe we've got a hundred of them out there that are in use. So we're going to put in a DHCP server, maybe running on the switch, it's maybe a separate server itself, etc. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but for now we'll say it's a separate server. So PCD boots up, and it's going to send a packet to the switch. And it's going to say, hey, I'm looking for a DHCP address I just turned on. The switch will take it and say, I know where there's a DHCP server. And it'll shoot it over to the DHCP. It'll take a look at the MAC address and say, okay, yep, you're not in my system, so I'm going to go ahead and assign you the next address in my pool. Sends that packet back to the switch. The switch looks at it, knows it's supposed to go back to PCD. PCD takes that, says, yay, I have an IP address now. 
So it has its DHCP address, which is going to assign its IP address, its gateway, its subnet mask, and perhaps some other information, um, usually like a DNS address, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Domain Name Service, or DNS. If everything communicates by IP, how do I browse web pages by names? So a DNS server resolves names to IP addresses. When assigning IP addresses to devices, it's important to add at least one DNS address. And DHCP can do this automatically. So when you assign your, your addresses to the pool, you just say, I want to assign this DNS or multiple DNSs to that DHCP reservation. A dynamic DNS can assign a static domain name to a dynamic address. We talked again about your router or your, your modem at home. That modem probably has a DHCP address from your ISP. So if you want to get in and access your thermostat or your video server or something like that, that address is changing from time to time. So Dynamic DNS is a service that actually runs and it watches. Every time your address changes, it sends information up and it propagates out to the DNS server and you basically have a URL, so www.myhome.com slash Jason. And that would get me into my network so that I could actually see my video server and things like that on there. So again, that's popular with small businesses and homes that cannot get a static IP. So let's take a look at the DNS example. So we have a DNS server, and it could be running on the DHCP server or something else, or it may just be our default gateway. There's also public DNS servers out there. Google has them, 8.8.8.8 .8 is a popular public DNS address from Google. So again, PCD is trying to go to isonus.com because he really likes this gear and he thinks it's really cool, so he wants to take a look at the, the website. So he doesn't know where it's at. He types in Isonus and the computer's like, I have no clue. I'm going to send that to the DNS server and try to figure out what my IP address that is. So he sends it to the switch. The switch knows, okay, yep, I've got a DNS server over here. The DNS server takes a look at it. If it doesn't know where it's at, it goes out and asks other DNS servers. But it already knows where it's at because other people have looked at it too. So it sends a packet back to the switch which then goes back to computer D and says, this is the IP address for www.isonus.com. And then the computer logs it in there. So whenever it needs to visit it, it already has the IP address logged in there until it reboots again. Network address translation, or port forwarding as it's most commonly called. While we can have thousands of private IP addresses in our network, we typically only have one or a handful of public addresses. So how do applications outside our network access resources inside if everything needs an IP address? Let's take a look at our home example again. We have our modem and our router, and we have maybe five devices inside our home that we want to view. We have a thermostat, we have a small video server, we have a security system that we want to view. How are we going to view all that if everything needs an IP address? NAT addressing allows us to forward a certain application's data to a specific IP address inside our network using TCP ports. Let's take a look at how it works. So I have my laptop and I'm working remotely and I want to view my video that's on host 3 inside my network. It's running on port 32100. And I know that my public address is 60.55.50.45. So I'm going to send a packet out to the internet, and it's going to bounce around the internet for a little bit until it finally reaches 60.55.50.45. I have a NAT rule inside my router that says always forward this port 32100 to IP address 192.168.1.130, which is host 3. So it forwards that packet to that PC, processes it on that port, and I have a connection between my remote laptop and that port. Now, I said I had five different things in my house. Do I really want to create five different rules in my router? Or if I'm a large business and I have dozens or hundreds of applications, do I really want to open up all of those ports on my router and create a bunch of complex rules? No, I do not want to mess with that. So I can create a VPN or a virtual private network. It extends a private network across a public network, such as the internet. It gives the device or user access to all the network resources without having to be directly connected to the network. 
This allows for greater flexibility and security than utilizing that. Obviously, anybody hitting our router could look and see which ports are open, and then they could see where those ports are being forwarded to and possibly be able to exploit our network from there. With a VPN, we don't have any of that. We have one port that's open for the VPN to connect in on. So how does this work? We'll take a look at our previous example. I have my video server on host 3. I've got my static public IP address on router 2. Now I have some files on host 2 I want to access and a database on host 1 that I want to pull some files from. I don't want to have to port forward all those different applications through. So I'm going to create a VPN tunnel between my laptop and router 2. Now on router 2 I have a built-in VPN software and then I just have a small program on my laptop that I run to connect in. And there's a lot of different VPNs and different types of security and there's a lot more to it but the basics of it are a VPN connection to my router. So once I connect in it authenticates me. It also provides me another IP address as if I'm sitting right on the network. So that way I can connect and view all of those different applications as though I'm sitting right there at my house. So even though I'm still connected to the internet, basically I don't really care about that anymore because I have this secure tunnel between my laptop and router 2 in order to access all those devices. So summary for our course, we talked about some key advanced concepts relevant to networks and how it may affect an ISONA system. This includes virtual LANs because typically our power nets and IP bridges will be on their own separate virtual LAN that may be restricted or very restricted depending on who can get to it and how it reacts when something is unplugged or something else is plugged into it. Static and dynamic IP addressing that most IT administrators will use some of both, static for servers and dynamic for everything else that's on the network. We talked about DNS, how it basically translates a URL, such as www.isonus.com, to an IP address so we can communicate. And port forwarding and virtual private networks are how we're going to connect with devices that are behind a private network that we need to gain access to while we're outside of that private network. Thank you for attending this course, and we hope it was beneficial to you. Have a great day.